Hi, my name is Ted Salmon, and I'm here today to talk about polarization microscopy, principles of polarization microscopy. And I'm going to focus on the polarization microscopy of mitotic spindle biofringence uh, in the time that we have available. Uh, I want to refer you to the uh, talk by Shinya Inoue, who, who discusses a num number of conceptual aspects of polarization microscopy and biofringent specimens, including double refraction and calcite crystals and uh, interesting biological applications like uh, 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 measuring the, the spicules and, 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 and sea urchin embryos, their bones, and, and, and a number of other pioneering achievements that he has made with polarization microscopy. In addition, I, I want to point out that an excellent introductory uh, uh, material on polarization microscopy is in uh, chapter, uh, or appendix three rather, of uh, Shin Yenwei's first book on video microscopy and other uh, good information is supplied by uh, Doug Murphy in his book. And at the end of my talk, I want to talk about modern advances in applying electronic and computer uh, um, computers to polarization microscopy that makes big advancements in, in, in pushing f forward uh, the analytical capability of this uh, important uh, microscopy method. Now, uh, let me begin by reminding you that uh, a point of that light propagates, in this case in the z-axis direction, uh, uh, as a uh, transverse vibrating uh, electrical and, and ma magnetic uh, wave. Uh, the vibrations are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Uh, the velocity of propagation, uh, v, is given by c divided by n, where n is the refractive index, and c is the velocity that light would have in a vacuum, or it's very similar in air. And n is a refractive index of the media through which the light is propagating. Now, this plane polarized light has its electric field vector uh, oscillating within a plane. And if we look, I can't do this here well, but if we look down the z-axis, as shown here, if it's plane polarized light, then this oscillation stays with its vector in this plane, and it can be defined by a given azimuth angle, theta in this case, relative to, let's say, an xy coordinate system that's or orthogonal to the z-axis of propagation. Lasers, for example, uh, emit polarized light uh, uh, from, co from coherent sources within the laser. On the other hand, if a tungsten filament uh, has many molecular oscillators that mo emit light asynchronously with different orientations, and one gets, as a result, unpolarized light with electric vectors in many different directions. And this is typical for most of the light sources that, that we encounter, uh, including arc lamps and, 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 and tungsten filaments uh, used in our light microscopes. Now, the basic components of a polarizing microscope uh, include a green filter to illuminate the specimen with monochromatic light in, in, at a wavelength that's not damaging to the specimen, and uh, 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 a polarizer to convert unpolarized light into plain polarized light. And polarized is the most commonly used material for polarizers. It's highly dichroic and, and, and transmits uh, 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 light vibrating preferentially in, in one direction, and that's given on the polarizer by this double arrowhead here. Uh, that you can see here that's usually marked on the polarizer. And that's aligned east and west on a, on a polarizing microscope, typically. And then we have <coughs> uh, condensers, objectives, and set up for the normal curler illumination. And in addition, a rotatable stage in a polarizing microscope because uh, contrast is, is going to be dependent on the rotation of the specimen relative to the, uh, uh, the polarizer transmission azimuth. And then, in addition, uh, polarizing microscopes can have biofringent compensators, and we're going to neglect that for the moment, uh, as well as an analyzer. And an analyzer is a polarizer whose vibration uh, transmission uh, direction is uh, oriented at 90 degrees to that of the polarizer. So it essentially is oriented to what's called the extinction position, to where it cancels the light coming from the polarizer in the background in the microscope. Now, if we look at an image of a mitotic spindle, which this one is isolated from a sea urchin embryo, uh, um, <coughs> and on the right-hand side is a polarization uh, um, 
a microscopy image of that spindle. And on the left-hand side is a phase contrast image of the same spindle. And <clears throat> if you notice in phase contrast, these little phase-dense particles of aggregates of ribosomes do not show up on the polarization image. And the reason is, is that there is no optical anisotropy that's detected uh, uh, in the polarization microscope uh, or, uh, uh, in these ribosomal particles. And they're rather isotropic, and in particular isotropic in their refractive index. On the other hand, the spindle fibers are anisotropic because they're uh, they have a refractive index uh, in the direction of the spindle fibers uh, that's larger in value than the refractive index that's perpendicular to that direction for these spindle fibers in the, in the central spindle uh, of this metaphase spindle and in the astral fibers that are going off in the axial direction away from the, the metaphase spindle. Now this anisotropy uh, called birefringence uh, uh, is produced in the spindle because of a form birefringence. The, the 25 nanometer diameter microtubules that are long are lined up like spaghetti in the direction, mainly in the axial direction of this central spindle. And it turns out that that makes the refractive index for light vibrating this way uh, larger than the refractive index for light vibrating in a perpendicular direction. Okay. And so uh, this makes the spindle fibers birefringent. And uh, this is true for both the central spindle uh, uh, fibers as well as the astral spindle fibers. Now the astral fibers uh, in this perpendicular direction to the axis of the spindle appear darker than the background. And this is because of the presence of this birefringent compensator. And, and we're going to discuss that uh, later in the talk. So for, for, for the next part of the talk, we'll just consider the central spindle Biofringence uh, and, and discuss the origins of that in the polarization microscopy. Now, spindle fibers are an example of the uniaxial biofringence. That is, there's an optic or C axis of symmetry of the fibers, and it's the direction of the fibers. And N sub B is called the extraordinary value of refractive index, and it, uh, for the, it's for the light vector. <coughs> Uh, electric vector vibrating in the direction of the optic axis, and the, in the direction perpendicular is called the, or, um, the ordinary or N sub O value for the light vector that's vibrating in, in that perpendicular direction. Birefringence, uh, it's a capital B, is equal to the difference between N sub B minus N sub O, and it's positive if N sub B minus N sub O is greater, um, is, 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 is plus or it's called negative of N sub B minus N sub O is minus. Now, the central spindle birefringence is actually relatively weak. And so, for the most part, that's, that, that's, that, that spindle is 0.0005 in birefringence. And for comparison, uh, quartz, which is a positively birefringent crystal, uh, uh, because of anisotropy in its atomic architecture, uh, is 0.009. Acetate sheets, which are long hydrocarbon polymers are positively birefringent, uh, but a, a negatively birefringent uh, specimen is ca calcite crystals, and it's a, 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 probably the most birefringent uh, material that, that I know anyway, which is 0.17, highly birefringent. And calcite crystals exhibit uh, uh, a very noticeable uh, double refraction for light that's, that's, that's propagating uh, not perpendicular to its vibration axes, uh, uh, incident light that's not perpendicular to its, its, its uh, vibration axes. And this double refraction is, is discussed very nicely in the talk given by uh, Shinya Inoue in this series. All right. We're going to consider here a simpler situation. Uh, first, we're going to consider a polarization microscope and we'll take out the compensator. And in addition, we're going to consider spindle-like uh, uh, birefringent materials in which we have aligned a filaments and uh, we'll, uh, for demo purposes, use a, uh, an acetate sheet uh, that has aligned filaments in one direction. And that sheet will be placed in the, uh, uh, on the slide cover slip preparation on our stage. And so the axes, uh, uh, the N sub B and N sub O axes, are going to be in the plane of the stage, 
and uh, uh, perpendicular to the direction of light, uh, the incident light coming from the from the polarizer. And we're going to orient these ac be able to orient these axes at various angles theta relative to the polarizer because we have a rotating stage. And in addition, I just wanted to add in this slide that, that there's another convention in polarization microscopy is that for some specimens you don't know exactly what n, n sub b and n sub o are, but you can figure out the vibration axes of, uh, by a method which I'll show you in a moment. And you can figure out which, which wave is the slow wave and which wave is the fast wave. The slow wave, the one that moves slowly through the biofringent material, uh, has the larger refractive index, and that's called the gamma wave. And the fast wave that moves more rapidly because it has a smaller refractive index is sometimes called the alpha wave. But for this talk, I'm going to uh, keep to our nomenclature N sub E and N sub O for our positively biofringent specimen, and that'll keep things simple. Okay, so here we are. So we're going to put uh, uh, the central spindle or a, a, an acetate sheet with its N sub E axis onto our stage of our microscope, and we're going to rotate it around 360 degrees. So we're going to rotate it around 360 degrees. And notice that every time the axis lines up with the polarizer direction or the analyzer direction over here, okay, or coming around here, or coming over here, that our light coming from the specimen is extinguished. It's equal to whatever the light is that leaks through the analyzer and the polarizer when they're crossed. All right? These positions, these extinction positions, define the, the directions of the vibration axes in the specimen. Because when your plane of polarization is lined up with one of the axes, then the light just simply goes through the specimen and is plain polarized light because the other axis is perpendicular to that direction and doesn't see any energy at all. Right? So this, when N sub B is down here, N sub O is perpendicular to it, and there's no energy in the N sub O axis. And vice versa, here we have N, N sub, sub O parallel to the polarizer, and the light moves through as an N sub O wave, and we don't see any N sub E. In between, when plane, when plane polarized light or, uh, 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 hits the specimen, it's instantly converted to two orthogonally polarized light beams. One, so if I'm plane polarized light, I go foop. One is going to be the N sub E, one will be the N sub O, and the N sub O moves faster, and so it's going to move through the specimen more quickly like that, right? right. So in the next slide shows how the light propagates through our specimen of a given thickness D. And so here we have incidence angle of 45 degrees to the axes, the vibration axes of our biofringent specimen. And then the N sub E wave is the vertical one, and the N sub O wave is the horizontal one. And the vertical one moves more slowly, the horizontal one moves more quickly. And because this is a transparent specimen, the frequency of vibration stays the same because we don't have any absorption. And when we exit material, we end up having a retardation between the N sub E and the N sub O wave, which is shown here as gamma, as a retardation. And it turns out, in this case, it's a quarter wavelength of the light in air, right? And retardation is quantified as N sub E times N sub O times the thickness of the specimen, right? So retardation gets bigger the larger the value of the birefringence, and it gets bigger the thicker the specimen is, right? And this retardation can be reflected in terms of the, the wavelength of light uh, and measured in radians by multiplying gamma by 2 pi and dividing it by the wavelength. Or you can reflect it in terms of degrees by multiplying by 360 and dividing by the wavelength. What is diagrammed here is the action of the analyzer on the, on the, the light that's coming from the biofringent specimen. And to uh, make things simple, I have set up the initial polarizer direction here vertically, and this is the, 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 the initial vector for plain polarized light. It's projected, uh, and I've got theta here for 45 degrees, so it's projected to give you equal amplitudes of, of the O wave and the E wave over here. And then these waves then project down onto the analyzer uh, vibration direction and they project equal amplitudes. 
And so we have uh, the, 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 the projected uh, magnitude of the vector uh, called E prime here coming from the, the E wave and the projected magnitude of the vector coming from the O wave are equal uh, but oriented in opposite directions on the analyzer. But this allows these waves to interfere with each other in the, in the vibration direction of the analyzer, right? And this, if these two waves were in phase with each other, then they would cancel each other and you would get no light coming from the analyzer. On the other hand, as they go out of phase with each other, uh, then they, th that interference no longer is destructive, no longer gives you z zero light, but in fact gives you light that's proportional to this retardation t term. Uh, it's not proportional, but depends on the sine squared of this retardation term measured in radians uh, divided by two, right? And this term over here on the left, the sine squared two theta term, is the variation in light intensity with the uh, uh, variation in theta, that is the axis orientations relative to the polarizer direction. And that was shown over here that uh, the intensity here goes as sine squared of two theta. So if theta at 45 degrees, two times 45 degrees is 90, and that makes sine, sine of 90 is one, so sine squared is one, and that's why we get maximum intensity uh, when we're oriented at plus or minus 45 or plus or minus 135. So this is a quantitative equation for the intensity of light produced by the birefringent retardation of the specimen. And this is shown graphically here for different amounts of retardation where this minimum value is highly exaggerated. This is the light that leaks through the microscope. It crossed analyzers and polarizers without a specimen or a compensator in place. And then this is the amount that comes through if you have a half wavelength retardation. And then this is the amount that comes through if you get a full wavelength. And you can see that once you reach a full wavelength, you're now equivalent to starting all over again. And at this point, you have plain polarized light equivalent to the, the orientation of the polarizer. And the analyzer crosses that, and you get extinction. So we get a simple equation for theta equals 45 degrees which is that the, the intensity through the analyzer is the leakage plus IP times sine squared of the re retardation and radians uh, divided by two, right? And so polarization microscopy is a quantitative method for measuring birefringent retardation, which means you can quantify how much anisotropic structural detail is there. And in the case of the spindle, it's allowed us over the years to quantify the microtubule number dense numbers in, in a volume uh, within the spindle uh, and, and thus measure, be able to measure in living cells the assembly and disassembly of those spindle fibers. Now, to do that quantification, we need to measure birefringence, and that's done with a compensator. And before I put in a compensator, let me just talk about the principles of additive and subtractive compensation. And this is done initially by taking an acetate sheet that's got a approximately a, a, a quarter wavelength retardation, and we'll just fold it in half. And when we fold it in half, we now double the thickness, but we've kept the axes the same. So the slow axis on the bottom is lined up in the same direction as the slow axis, that is the larger refractive index axes on the top. So we have twice the retardation, and we get a brighter light uh, for that. In this case, we're going to go to a half wavelength for worth of retardation. On the other hand, if we fold this at 45 degrees, then we're going to cross the axes, which is, will produce what's called subtractive compensation. So that the, the, the larger refractive index axis that's on the bottom uh, uh, produces a slow wave. This is the fast wave. But when this wave enters into the top, it now is lined up with the, 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 the lower refractive index value, so it becomes the fast wave. And what was originally the fast wave becomes a slow wave. And because the thickness of the acetate is constant, one ends up with an equal and opposite retardation on the top. This ends up producing a, a net zero total retardation, so it's a subtractive mode, and we get extinction, right? So we have exactly extinction here. So uh, in practice, um, 
an adjustable biofringent compensator is put in the light path um, uh, and with its vibration axes at 45 degrees to the analyzer polarizer direction and then uh, a positive compensation can be used to brighten the background in the polarized light image and so if we have just the co compensator in there with its uh, axes oriented in this direction we brighten the background uh, corresponding to the retardation produced by that compensator uh, with this orientation of its vibration axes and the larger, uh, larger refractive index being in this direction. Now the spindle also has its uh, larger refractive index along the spindle axis and so these two exhibit additive compensation and that makes the central spindle biofringence brighter than the background right and as well as these astral microtubules here brighter than the background uh, in our spindle image. On the other hand the, uh, the spindle fibers and their, their microtubules uh, their uh, uh, vibration axes have the end sub, sub E axis oriented this way in an orthogonal direction to the compensator axis so we get subtractive compensation for those and that produces an image of those fibers that's darker than the background and so that's how we get the light dark image in polarized light it depends on the orientation of the axes of the specimen with the axes of the compensator now uh, to measure retardation uh, the older method to do this was by hand with variable compensators like the cinema and Bryce Kaler and you can adjust these so that you can in fact do negative subtractive compensation until you get maximum darkness from the specimen and then from that you can read off the dial what the actual retardation is at, uh, for that specimen biofringent retardation. Uh, if you have larger retardations uh, you can get a feeling for the uh, magnitude of the retardation as well as the, the orientation of the fast and slow axes by using a red plate uh, and a red plate is also used to produce colored images of specimens that have a moderate uh, biofringent retardation. The spindle biofringent retardation is about 2 nanometers, so a red plate doesn't, isn't much use. But for, let's say, a muscle fiber that has 100 nanometer retardation, then the red plate is very useful. So a red plate <coughs> is a biofringent uh, piece of quartz, let's say, uh, 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 whose retardation is 550 nanometers and so green light comes through a red plate and ends up with a full wave retardation and so when you illuminate with white light the analyzer extinguishes the green light and you get uh, 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 blue <coughs> and red coming through which makes this magenta sort of background in the red plate. If you have a specimen and it's uh, larger refractive index uh, or, or slow axis is lined up with the slow axis of the, of, the, of the red plate then those two will combine together that makes a longer reach, a larger retardation then you'll get subtraction of the red light leaving you a bluish colored bustle uh, because of the transmission of blue and green and uh, alternately if, the, if you rotate the, uh, the muscle uh, uh, so the slow axis is in this, this direction you'll get subtractive uh, uh, compensation and so you will subtract out the blue light and get a yellow image from the green and, 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 and the red that, that are coming through. So uh, um, that's about all I'm, I'm going to go into in depth uh, in, in, in the use of the microscope but I sort of wanted to end up before uh, talking about the electronic advancements more recently is to give you a few practical aspects which is no dust, cal remember calcite or chalk should not be in the room, uh, a rotatable stage, adjustable compensator. Um, for objects like spindles you need intense uh, mono monochromatic illumination or long exposures because they're very weakly biofringent in order to get sufficient intensity to see things. All right, polarizers should have extinction factors, which is the ratio of uh, polarizer analyzer being parallel to them being crossed of a thousand or, or better, and 35% transmission efficiency uh, when they're parallel. It's important that the lenses be selected not to have any birefringence that is produced by photoelasticity in glass, 
or the cements, right? And finally, because there's rotation of the plane of polarization in highly curved lens surfaces that are in high NA objectives, it's useful to be able to employ some form of rectification, which uh, Shinya Inoue discusses in his talk. So I want to finish up by mentioning uh, uh, the Ru Rudolf Oldenburg's liquid crystal pole scope. And using a liquid crystal compensator controlled by voltages, which are controlled by a computer, for every image pixel, uh, uh, th these retarders can measure retardation and the axes of orientation uh, in a specimen uh, independently. So the retardation image that's captured is proportional to retardation independent of axis orientation. And the orientation image that is, that is uh, obtained is proportional to the orientation of the axes independent of the retardation. Now I want to show you a movie in which they show you just the, the uh, uh, retardation image and this movie is calibrated uh, where black is zero retardation and white here is two nanometers of retardation and it's a time-lapse movie of my meiosis and, and, and the insect crane fly uh, viewed with polarized light and it, with this LC pole scope. And so here we go. It's a very beautiful movie, and you can see uh, the kinetochore fibers uh, down in here very clearly, and you'll be able to see anaphase. There's a kinetochore fiber right there. And you can quantify how many microtubules are in those fibers and how they change as the chromosomes are pulled forward uh, from the retardation in the images. And there's lots of other interesting information in these mitochondrial bundles and the birefringence of the, of the cell surface and in many of the little membrane vesicles here that are now visible in this type of um, microscopy imaging that was not very easy to see previously. Thank you very much and I hope you have a chance to get in the lab and to play with a polarizing microscope.